Somewhere along the way, I became an old man. In so much as I feel age coming upon me, and pleasantly so. Really, nobody ever talks about how pleasant it is to get older. To trade one set of ears and eyes for another. To take another turn, find another place in the great wheel. To appreciate the the language of our ancestors. I know that the purpose of my life was to learn the language of my ancestors. That was the purpose I was born with. It's the purpose coded into my DNA. And I was able to perceive its voice, its gentle, gentle voice in my life. No one's going to save us from the situation that we're in but our ancestors. And that's a real quest. You know, we see movies like Lord of the Rings and quests and hero's quests and grail quests and Homer had his odyssey and we have ours. But this quest is free of a lot of the artifice of the past and all of the the richness of it. We who seek out the language, the commerce of our ancestors, know that we cannot look to man. We cannot look to man to account for the unnecessary suffering of people. I say we cannot look to man. And this has been one of the most profound conclusions of my years of clinical research and field study of all of the psychological ramifications of a militarized society. A study of which you will never find in any scientific journal, in any book, in any magazine, in any piece of art or science. And yet, to me, it is the greatest voice of all of them. Because it declares the voice of man a fugitive by birth. And I'm interested in the very thing this world wishes to silence the most, and that is the voice of man, that is the voice of our ancestors. Man, the mother and mind of man. Hear me well when I say man, the mother, and the mind of man. Our ancestral celestial biology. Because you and I were not treated the way we should have been. Our mothers and fathers were not treated the way they should have been. And they know that. And our ancestors know that. That is a truth. That is a truth written in the book of our flesh and blood. The book that every witness in court should really be swearing on. As opposed to the book that has only ever brought disease and death to the world. In in fact, the Christian cross is a symbol of death. And is a symbol of desecration and denigration of our ancestral knowledge. Our ancestral celestial biology. And I need to account for that. And so man will not really save us. Um, It will be the animals, for one. The ducks, the whales, the wolves, the eagles, the crawling, flying, swimming, and running things. It'll be the trees. It'll be the stars. It'll be the constellations of our own flesh and blood that will save us. Not from, but for ourselves. For 
the greatest pain that we suffer is the pain of ourselves. And nobody will ever tell you that. The greatest pain that we suffer. And a lot of people don't suffer it because their brains cut it off. So they don't even want to know it exists. So they may not suffer it, suffer it but they are hostile toward it. And they, they won't even know why. The greatest suffering of man is the suffering of ourselves and of our voices. And in our greatest suffering lay our voices. And no one can take you there but you. And our ancestors and the animals and the trees and the stars and the seasons. They hurt in a way, do they not? They hurt. It hurts, doesn't it? It hurts to not be able to talk to our ancestors. It hurts not to hear their voices. Doesn't, doesn't it? It hurts to hear the tortur tortured voices of our families and of our fellow man. It hurts. It has hurt me. That's my greatest injury, if it must be known. And I've had some considerable injuries, is to hear the tortured voice of man. I hear it every day. I can't begin to tell you. But let me explain that I've studied very carefully and had all of my time to do that for going on 25 years. And I've never ceased to be horrified and deeply, grievously injured and saddened by the tortured voice of my fellow man. I'm an intelligent man, and it's not hard to take the measure of the minds of those around me, particularly when we, they begin to tell me about their beliefs. And I make tentative forays into challenging their logic. And I won't begin to recount how easy it is to dissemble what they call their highest truths. And their highest truths are never, we have MRI scans, their highest truths are never, electricity is fun. It's never the law of thermodynamics, no. Their highest truths is the picture in their minds that tells them that life could be okay. The world's not so bad. And that happiness is real and attainable. If by arduous or austere means that will take us no closer to the resolution of our heritage, then flapping our arms will take us to the moon. So as I get older, my voice becomes a little more practiced. I become a little less scared is what I might of what I might have to say. But I don't like having to see the fear in those around me who would suffer to hear my voice. But I've listened carefully to those fears my whole life. And I've developed the ability to speak one on one with people in a way that won't trouble them too much while still attempting to stimulate their minds. Because what I have to say is just too important. It's too rich. And it, it's, a, it's a current that must be discharged. It is a growth that must be unfolded. A growth in all of our lives. A growth that as diverse and cosmic as it is, something that we can share in with the most rudimentary language the language of our ancestors. Something that bonds us and binds us, protects us, keeps us safe, and feeds everything that should be fed in man. I don't use superlatives, you'll notice, when talking about ancestral celestial biology, as in it's massive and it's all loving. It's got your back. Because I don't speak on its behalf. I either address my ancestors or they address me. There's no in between. Listen, if you will, to the sound of your ancestors. Ignore me, if you must, but listen to the voices of your ancestors. I speak in the name of my people. Now perhaps you would say, 
that is enough. This is too rich a wisdom to put on a military and religious device. What is precisely the kind of thing that one should use to disturb the most primeval status quo. But this actually doesn't disturb most people. And will never allow it to offend their sensibilities. That, that honor and that, that distinction will be left to a few people. Not the least of them will be my own children. But you know, I fancy that everyone can hear the sound of these words if they've ever heard a baby cry, if they've ever, ever heard an eagle cry, a wolf howl, the sound of birds in morning or the crickets, the frogs, or the toads at dusk. The sound of water running, a tap, the wind through some trees, the crack of a stick, or perhaps the droning engines of a mechanized society, whose slaves will never know how enslaved they are, how in bondage they really are, how disoriented and dislocated they really are and how all of their efforts at happiness have only have utility because these efforts are pathologically and sociopolitically alloyed with disintegrating the minds of their children. Yes. This is the unavoidable conclusion when you subject the entirety of the world to a cursory level of scrutiny. Listen, if you will, to the book of your flesh and blood. Ours. An enormous communication of life. I feel it in me, you know. My ancestors want to talk to me, through me, with me. It's a pressure. It, uh, it has a profound effect on me. And it's very hard to me to give voice to it. It's, it's as hard for me to give voice to as it was once upon a time hard for me to give voice to the kinds of injuries I sustain from my own family. But beneath our greatest hurts, it's the most powerful voice of man, and the world needs to hear it. We need to hear it. It is a medicine, you see, composed of the language of our ancestors. The function of our brains and the restoration of our homes, of our minds, and of our dignity defined only by our own voices. You see, true architecture is made of the voice of man. Because all life, all causes and effects are the communication of the power of man, the will of man. Yes, man the mother and mind of man. That puts things quite simply, don't you think? But these are complicated things for a world that has desecrated the voice of man for thousands of years. And to take stock of that requires effort, dedication, and courage. In fact, all the virtues usually attributed to the ones required by members of the military the workforce, schools of engineering, science, and medicine. None of which have anything to do with protecting us or making us feel better. Because 90% of the mandate of every one of their 
trained professional soldiers is to desecrate and disintegrate the mind of their fellow man. And it's the same mandate of all the religions and all the philosophies and all the psychology and all the spirituality. All the cultures of the world have gone septic. And septic systems disintegrate everything. And the function of antiseptic forces is to comprehend having itself the capacity to incorporate the scale and nature of the disintegration of all life as a process in life and as a force of life. But to do that, the septic systems of the body have to betray their instincts, the instincts of systems of repression out of a pain that so desecrates and denigrates the mind that it changes its function to pass along the scale and nature of that denigration through every system of human communication, through every family. More or less, we shan't quibble. The results are evident. War is ubiquitous. We live in a world saturated with warfare. A septic system. The antiseptic is able to recognize the necessity of having incorporated these septic functions into our flesh and blood by force, by necessity, and for our own survival. To do usually not much more than to pass on the septic imperative of a cybernetic industrial society that render us, all of us repressive, aggressive, cybernetic industrial functionaries who flee desperately into realms of spirituality usually with which to justify our most compulsive necessity to denigrate the minds of other people. And yes, I understand what a terrible condemnation that is of my fellow man. I learned to betray the confidence of my family in order to live and to heal and to learn more for all our sakes about the good medicine and the most accurate assessment of the injuries of my family and the voices that lay buried in those injuries, the voices that were silenced. Because I know the sound of the human voice, I know the sound of my sister and my brother and my father, I know the sound when that voice is silence, and that is a sound I wish I had never heard. That is a sound I wish I didn't spend every day listening to. You talk about pandemonium in hell, that's my music. I don't wear a set of headphones. I hear the deafening silence of the voice of man and the kind of joy in our children whose loss is commensurate with that of music itself, if you take my meaning. And the world is too quiet that way, and I wish to stir it from its fitful dreams. And I say this in the name of my ancestors and of Lord Satan and of my most sacred voice.